It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Messer. Arlene Messer, uh, Arlene practices holistic and biological dentistry in Rochester, right here in town. She is an accredited member of the International Organization of Oral Medicine and Toxicology and the Holistic Dental Association. Dr. Messer also has fellowship status at the Las Vegas Institute for Advanced Dental Studies, where she gained expertise in full mouth rehabilitation and TMJ therapy. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. So let's have a little fun. All right. Um, I'd like to take you back to the year 1920. And let's just imagine that this room is the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum. And you have been admitted here due to your debilitating, crippling depression, insomnia, and suicidal thoughts. And your doctor is the world-renowned psychiatrist, Dr. Henry Cotton. And on Monday morning, you are scheduled for a procedure that in hopes will cure you of your mental illness. Dr. Cotton will take you to the operating theater where he will um, take out every single one of your teeth, all in hopes of curing you of the infection that probably caused your mental illness. And Dr. Cotton states that all mental disorders stem from infection uh, in distant organs uh, polluting the brain. And if that does not work, Dr. Cotton will return to the operating theater and remove your tonsils, spleen, stomach, testicles, and ovaries. And um, <laughs> all in hopes of curing you of your mental illness. And this cutting edge medical technique is lauded by the medical community worldwide. He actually gave lectures worldwide on this um, as the new approach uh, for modern times. This is called the focal theory of infection and the cure is called surgical bacteriology. And it makes you wonder who belongs in the asylum. And as insane as that might sound, the focal theory um, uh, of infection has its merits, and it was very, very much accepted at the time. Uh, the uh, germ theory was in its infancy, and so it was ve very well respected. And believe it or not, the problem with Dr. Cotton was um, not even his methodology. It was the fact that he, um, he was dogmatic and megalo, he had a megalomaniac approach. He believed um, that he held um, the only cure, that that was the only cure for mental illness. He failed to look at the matter skeptically. He did not invite the scrutiny of the scientific community. And he failed to open his mind to any other approach. And horrible things happen when people assume they hold the only truth. For one thing, they ignore any evidence to the contrary. And for another, they exaggerate their successes. Dr. Cotton claimed an 85% success rate, but in reality, 45% of his patients died. The rest were left toothless, mangled, and maimed, all in a pursuit of a cure that did not exist since none of his patients got better. This cautionary tale illustrates a point. We have to question everything. We've got to have an open mind, willingness to examine our convictions, test, and embrace change if the evidence proves to be incorrect. And this is the foundation of holistic dentistry because so many of our long-held beliefs in dentistry, our concepts, have been proven ineffective, some downright wrong, possibly toxic to the patient and to the environment. Yet these protocols are still practiced and endorsed today. I've been asked many times what is holistic or biological dentistry. And it means taking a snapshot of the entire person and targeting therapy for the individual patient. It means using biocompatible materials that are not, are not hazardous to the environment or to the patient. It also means collaborating with other healthcare providers, whether it's integrative physicians, naturopaths, nutritionists, you name it. So working closely with other healthcare providers for patients that are chronically ill or just patients that want to maintain or improve their good health. 
And JFK said, change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. We don't want to miss the future, as I'm sure you all don't as well. Biological dentistry honors the past. They, it saved millions and millions and millions of teeth. We live in the present, but we think a lot about how we're going to move forward and improve the future of dentistry. And oftentimes, the future involves learning from the past. We have a disease, the most prevalent disease on this planet. It is 100% curable and preventable, but the disease is still raging on, and that is called dental tooth decay. And we know that tooth decay is preventable. And uh, because of a contemporary of the infamous Dr. Cotton, this is Dr. Weston Price. Yes, uh, Weston Price had the kind of open mind and sense of inquiry that biologic and holistic dentists value very deeply. He could be the father of holistic dentistry. As a practicing dentist in Cleveland, Ohio, he noticed that despite modern medical advances, his patients had oral disease and physical degeneration. He focused on how to make the future better uh, for oral health, and Dr. Price found some intriguing things in his travels across the globe. He went to the four corners of the globe, to isolated communities, and found some, as I said, some very interesting things. Take a look at the teeth of these um, individuals, how straight, lovely, fa no facial deformities, no crowding, um, and this, uh, there appeared to be no need for orthodontic correction at all. He went through thousands of skulls in these isolated communities, thousands of skulls, hundreds of years old. Not one had dental decay. Not any needed orthodontic correction. And uh, their diet consisted of their traditional foods uh, with, that were untouched by the modern Western diet. Look at these faces. After one generation, that's 20 years, just one generation, rampant decay, facial structural abnormalities, when the modern diet was introduced. That means sugar and white flour. So one of the first keys to oral and whole body health is clearly nutrition. Even the World Health Organization recognized that nutrition begins to affect a baby's teeth even before they're visible in the mouth. That's very significant, that nutrition affects a baby's teeth even before we ever see it erupted. And if you couple poor nutrition with high sugar intake, you will have rampant decay. And we might think this is not a problem in the United States, but even right here in Rochester with a 31% poverty rate, we know that poor nutrition is happening here for adults and children alike. So it seems that nutrition is paramount to healthy teeth. Yet since childhood, we have only heard brush and floss. You're going to be good to go, brush and floss. But what's the reality? The reality is that in 2009, studies stated there is a global increase in dental caries, a pending public health crisis, global increase. This is a crisis, and this has serious implications for systemic and oral health globally. $30 billion, that's with a B, is spent just filling cavities every year. In my practice alone, and I'm sure in every dental practice, we see five to 10 patients at least a day that have cavities. Now, with fluoride in our toothpaste, in our mouthwash, we brush and we floss, why? Now, this is, again, where holistic dentistry comes in. We try to find out why. Why does one person brush and floss have cavities and another brush and floss no cavities? So when we find out the why of the problem, we can target our therapy for the individual patient. And in order to prevent tooth decay, we have to understand what tooth decay is. Tooth decay is not a one-time event. Tooth decay is a process. And our mouths are home to multiple strains of bacteria, both good and bad. It is an entire ecosystem. And it works when everything is in balance. But our mouths are like a battlefield. 
constantly demineralizing the breaking down of enamel with acids and remineralizing, building up of the teeth with minerals. This happens 24 seven in our mouths. The cycle occurs constantly. And when bacteria are fed sugar, it breaks down the enamel. That hard layer on the outside of the tooth, it is the hardest um, component, it's the hardest thing in our entire body. But it can be destroyed by bacteria. And saliva is the amazing, wondrous liquid that contains a super saturated solution of minerals, buffering agents, antimicrobial agents, and cleansing water. It is the perfect cycle of protection for your teeth. It would be an amazing toothpaste. Unfortunately, not everything functions perfectly. And sometimes the scales get tipped towards demineralization, the breaking down of teeth and enamel. The predominant strains of bacteria in our mouth are strep mutans and lactobacillus. And these, uh, these bacteria proliferate and excrete acids. And when these um, bacteria overwhelm your uh, saliva's capacity to protect your teeth, you get a cavity. And one new direction in thinking I would like you to hear is this. Tooth decay is an infectious, transmissible disease. You did not inherit soft teeth. You were inoculated with the bacteria that causes you to have cavities. This is an infectious disease. One of the most common, uh, one of the most common ways in which it is shared is within family groups. Mother to child, sibling to sibling, sibling to sibling. And why? The whole household should be included in preventative measures. So the primary causes of decay are bacteria, an acidic environment. The bacteria produce the acid and then they thrive in their acidic environment. Sugar feeds that bacteria and saliva, as we mentioned, when you have low saliva flow, when you don't have a lot of saliva, you are much more prone to have a cavity. There are about 400 different medications that cause uh, dry mouth or xerostomia. So it's a, a very, very important risk factor. And if any one of these factors is out of balance, you have a much higher probability of getting cavities. Even with the old standby drill and fill, the disease will rage on in high risk individuals because the source of decay is not addressed. It is like termites that have infected your house. You can rebuild the house, but as long as the termites are present, the house will continue to break down. This is why I first became interested in holistic dentistry because of the frustration of the patient and myself. Patients coming in constantly filling and refilling their teeth. Very, very frustrating. So I needed to explore it, go a little bit deeper. And um, so what are some new directions in decay prevention? The first step, one that is quite easy to do but is crucial, is to establish your risk factors. How likely are you to develop a cavity? And here's what we look at. High risk is visible decay or decay noted on an x-ray, white spots, cavities within the last three years. It has been documented if you had a cavity um, within three years, you are much more likely to get a cavity. Infrequent dental visits, of course, and poor oral hygiene, high sugar and white flour products, and xerostomia, as we talked about before. You are at moderate risk for getting a cavity if your tooth anatomy has deep pits and grooves, poor restorations, recession, exposed roots, orthodontic brackets, frequent snacking, recreational drug and alcohol use, and high sugar intake. My patients think I'm pretty strange when I ask them to spit into a cup. But I can tell some really interesting things when we do that. With salivary tests, we can see the pH of the saliva, we can see the quantity and the quality of the bacteria, how well it fights acids, the buffering capacity, and if there is yeast overgrowth, because yeast contributes to dental decay as well. So, do teeth even matter? How does oral health impact a person's life? There is the obvious physical discomfort, but there is a heartbreaking psychological toll as well. You may have seen the story of a waiter who was left the best tip ever when his customer 
gave uh, paid, agreed to pay for his dental work because his teeth were so decayed. I think it changed his whole face, but probably his entire life. And uh, my patient, Carol, was only 30, 35 years old, and she told me her favorite food is fried chicken. Oh, well. But she hasn't been able to eat a piece in seven years because she cannot chew. And can you imagine that feeling? Not being able to eat the foods you love. Patients with extreme decay uh, learn how to smile without showing their teeth. They don't uh, uh, smile for family photographs. They feel the social stigma attached with having bad teeth. Carol said she felt like a redneck or hillbilly because of her decayed and missing teeth. Patients with dental disease, again, express extreme frustration with the drilling and filling over and over again with the expense and the time of, um, of the teeth breaking down and again and, and the pain and expense that goes along with it. Clearly, we need to address this issue with simple, inexpensive, safe protocols that make it easy for the majority of the population to prevent decay. And one thing your childhood dentist was right about, and that is stay away from sugar. A significant way we can prevent decay is with the minimization and the elimination of sugar. I know that's hard to do. Adding sugar to any food increased its cavity potential. I recently met an eight-year-old boy who presented in our practice with rampant decay. He was only eight years old. And his mother also presented with rampant decay. Remember, we talked about family transmission. And his mother was shocked that he had such decay in his mouth because she keeps a very strict watch over his diet because she said he has celiac disease. OK. Now, remember, he's eight. He's, those permanent teeth have only been in his mouth for two years. He had a cellulitis up into his eye. His permanent molar had to be removed. That tooth had only been in his mouth for two years. The son happened to be in a different room from his mother. And I questioned the young man about his diet. I didn't interrogate him, but I did question him. And I asked him what he had for breakfast. And he said to me, I have celiac disease, and I can't have any gluten, so I have gluten-free waffles. And, or I have oatmeal, or I have gluten-free cereal. I said, oh, good for you. So what do you put on your waffles? Maple syrup. I said, what do you put on your oatmeal? Brown sugar. And what about your cereal? Sugar. And I said, I, and I, I mentioned this to mom, and mom said to me, but it's organic. <laughs> I kid you not, that's exactly what, and she is not the only one in the very, very same day. A grown woman, high, very high functioning adult, uh, came in, uh, presented with cavities, and questioned her about her diet. Same thing. She has a very uh, high carbo simple carbohydrate diet. And when I mentioned it to her, she said, I only eat organic. So I think we take for granted uh, what, that people understand what they are eating. These are, as I said, these are high-functioning adults. These are not people from the street. All of our patients, yours and mine, desperately need nutrition counseling. Again, we take for granted that patients know what they are putting in their mouth. This young man, this is a dietary questionnaire we give to our patients. This young man stated when I asked him before I gave him this, how is your diet? Oh, I eat pretty healthy vegetables. And then when we started a little, we got a little bit more in depth, you can see uh, soda? Mountain Dew twice a day, 12 ounces, Red Bull, 16 ounces a day. And this young man, without us, you know, without, before we gave this to him, he said he has a very good diet, and he might. He might eat a lot of vegetables, but certainly he, he comes back over and over again to have his teeth drilled and filled. And just one more example. This is Charlene, 26, again, rampant decay. We spent a lot of time repairing all of these teeth. And one of the last times she came in, she brought this, this big on my counter. I, I kid you not, and when we, and our dental assistants are here so they can vouch for what I'm saying, uh, especially Tammy. And when she saw the look of horror on my face, she said, it's not so bad, it's not soda. 
because at every single visit, I would talk to her about her diet. It's not so bad, it's not soda. Again, people do not understand what they are eating or drinking. So how can we prevent this from happening? What are some, again, simple, inexpensive protocols that anybody can do to protect their teeth? And remember how we talked about risk factors. For people with very low risk of decay, really brushing with the simplest toothpaste you can, non-abrasive, um, non-whitening, just this most simple without anything in it should be fine. Brushing, flossing, um, and of course minimizing uh, sugar. And of course, regular dental visits. Yeah. And for moderate to high risk individuals, it's very, very different. And these are some additional steps that can be taken. The protective factors are pH, antimicrobials, saliva, remineralization, and diet and nutrition. For pH balance, because bacteria thrive in an acidic environment, as I mentioned, we can make a very simple, inexpensive mouthwash. Remember, if we can. Um, uh, make the saliva more alkaline, we have a much better chance of fighting tooth decay. So baking soda, salt, xylitol, actually is antimicrobial, but it's optional, and um, one cup cooled green tea. You mix it, make a jar of it, use it. Baking soda in a water pick or toothpaste. Baking soda is antimicrobial, it's alkaline, simple and inexpensive. And here's an interesting fact about hard cheese. Hard cheese, like a cheddar. Hard, half an ounce, not even a half an ounce, the studies show five grams, which is probably more of a quarter of an ounce, I would say, of hard cheese significantly reduces tooth decay if you have it after breakfast every day for two years. Every day for two years, hard cheese, believe it or not. It will work even better if you, have a, if you are prone to decay and you have a snack. I would throw a little piece of cheese in there. Why? Why is that? Uh, and why? Because it remineralizes teeth. Antimicrobial eliminates or minimizes the bacteria that cause cavities. As I mentioned, strep mutans and lactobacillus. Again, baking soda is antimicrobial. You can use it. Arm and Hammer makes it. Mentadent makes it um, in a water pick. Coconut oil pulling actually is also antimicrobial. You can do five to ten minutes first thing in the morning and then spit it in the garbage. Boom. Uh, put it down your sink. An iodine swab. Iodine is a very, it's done only in the office. It's, uh, it's very, the simplest thing you can do. Iodine is a powerful antimicrobial. It's been used in dental offices for decades. It's very, very safe. And a simple swab in the office is a very simple preventative measures. However, some contraindications with thyroid conditions. Cow's milk. Again, uh, this uh, cow's milk is uh, great as an antimicrobial and for remineralization. It has lactose, calcium, phosphorus, casein, all of which inhibits cavities. And get ready for one that might surprise you. Clorox bleach, sodium hypochlorite. And um, its use, its antimicrobial safety has been used for over 100 years. It's naturally pleasant in our neutrophils. And by creating a dilute solution of one part Clorox to 20 parts water, rinsing three times a week or using it in a water pick is very, very effective in cutting down the bacteria. Again, we're going to try and increase salivary output to fight cavities. Saliva washes the debris away and is loaded with cavity fighting elements. So we want to, in, uh, here's an interesting fact. Eating uh, fibrous foods, or actually eating a meal, increases your salivary output by 10 times. That's very significant, 10 times. You know, if you have not had, let's say you have low saliva flow, you take medications, you're, you know, your glands are still functioning. It's not like you have been radiated or anything like that. Your glands are still functioning. So you can very effectively increase the output of saliva by, again, eating fibers and stimulating with mince gum made with xylitol. You can use Sally's lozenges, Trident Extra, which is great with re Recaldent. I'll show you what that looks like, and Zellies. And uh, we talked about medications affecting uh, saliva and remineralization. We have to make the teeth stronger. We're going to remineralize teeth. We can use MI paste. It's sold in dental offices. It's made with calcium and phosphate. Very effective. It's, it tastes good easy to use. You don't brush with it, you just put it on your finger, rub it in. Trident Extra, Extra Care I think it's called. Again, it has calcium phosphate in it. It's 
It, it is very, very good. And hard cheese for remineralization, as we talked about before. What it doesn't say there, which I, um, with the gum, with the gum for uh, remineralization, we're gonna chew it three times per day for 10 minutes in between meals. Three times a day for 10 minutes in between meals. So, um, now you're not gonna hear this from every dentist, but fluoride, fluoride. I hate fluoride. We've all heard about fluoride, right? And a huge controversy about it. And there are two different types of fluoride. There's systemic fluoride, the kind that's in our municipal water supply that you drink. And then there's topical fluoride. Topical fluoride is what's in our toothpaste and in our mouthwash. Now the municipal water fluoride is, gets, uh, the fluoride gets dumped in from the phosphate fertilizer industry. They get to dump their crap into our water for nothing. And it's loaded with impurities. It's got arsenic, uh, among other things. And it's been linked to many detrimental health conditions. It's a medication. Fluoride is a medication get, that is being dispensed to people regardless of their medical conditions or their risk factors or their age. And when we talk about a new way of thinking that one size doesn't fit all, I, I think about fluoride a lot because although I hate systemic fluoride in the water supply, and I am vehemently opposed to water fluoridation, topical fluoride is somewhat different. It is pharmaceutical grade fluoride. It is neutral sodium fluoride. And as I said, it's dispensed in, as needed in dental products. It is not designed to be ingested. The CDC states the predominant effect of Fluoride is topical. Fluoride does not have to be ingested. Fluoride drops are ridiculous. Fluoride in the water is ridiculous. Fluoride is topical. It has to touch the teeth. So this is the CDC stating topical fluoride. That's the, that is why it's effective. Uh, and it's incredibly effective at remineralizing teeth. It speeds up the process of the calcium and phosphate getting remineralized into the teeth. It's more effective. If you just have calcium and phosphate, it will always be more effective in the presence of fluoride. Fluoride is also antimicrobial. So you can see why dentists kind of love it. Um, if, if fluoride reduces tooth decay, in, this is in over 800 separate studies. Fluoride reduces tooth decay by 20 to 40%. However, I, I do have to say it does not eliminate cavities. It cannot override sugar in the diet. And I have done a lot of research on topical fluoride because I get the question all the time. You're a holistic dentist. How could you even mention fluoride? You know, you, I have done extensive research trying to find any detrimental effects from topical fluoride. And every single article, every single book, everything on the internet that is written, it is all with um, systemic fluoride only. I, I yet to find one article that says that topical fluoride is unsafe. It's something that we just brush with for 30, well, hopefully more than 30 seconds, but, and rinse with it. And I know that still many people are violently opposed to it, and, uh, but I do want to show you something. This is Patrick. This is Patrick in 2004. This is Patrick in 2005. I don't think you have to be a dentist to see that something is really wrong with this patient's teeth. One year, it went from this to this. And as I said, even if you're trained to look at x-rays, you can see this is not a good situation. This is serious, rampant, extensive decay. This type of extensive decay moves fast. And this is going to take every single weapon that we have to fight this. Pat has a serious transmissible disease. And we have to always weigh the cost versus benefit whenever we make a recommendation. Because this patient is going to have, this is going to impact this patient's health very significantly. This is an inflammatory condition. It is systemic. So as I said, we're going to fight it with whatever tools we have, and I feel it would be negligent for me not to at least advise, give this patient an option of using topical fluoride. I never recommend it to all patients, never recommend it to all patients, but if patients like this who has rampant decay, I feel, as I said, it is negligent of me not to give them the option of it. 
And as I said, this is always used in conjunction with the other protective factors. And I literally have gotten hate mail. I really have. What, as I said, what kind of holistic dentist? Because you go on the internet, if your dentist, your dentist is not holistic if they say you can use fluoride. And you know, we always have to put everything in perspective. I mean, with cancer therapy, there are so many side effects, but yet we use it. Of course we use it. So this, of course, fluoride's not for everybody, but a patient like this, you know, we have to give up, we have to give them an option. And sometimes, despite our best efforts, decay does occur and the tooth is in need of some serious attention. Sometimes the only way to save a tooth is with another controversial subject, root canals. Okay. And, and you may have heard things that all root canals are toxic and they harbor um, in infection and should be removed. Of course, there are other dentists that feel, you know, conventional dentists, root canals are no problem. So, is it good or is it bad? First of all, what is a root canal? Well, you know, a root canal is the kind of the progression that you see on the slide. That's infection and that's getting cleaned out. And that's uh, the root canal filled and sealed. The problem and the controversy is that there are hair-like lateral canals that run this way through the tooth. And you can't see them and they're very, very difficult to fill and they can harbor bacteria in the future. And one of the concerns of root canal therapy that maybe you've read um, is the rare potential for something called cavitation. Cavitation is a hole in the bone. And the hole in the bone can harbor bacteria. It can harbor fungus and infection. This can also occur following extraction of a very infected tooth. And having uh, this hidden infection can tax the immune system, leak into the bloodstream, and affect other body systems. This is Dr. Messer's tooth. Dr. Messer's tooth, right here. And you can see, um, or I will point it out, this is pathology here in my tooth. And this is a root canal that was retreated. And although um, I sensed that something wasn't right, but I didn't have pain. And the only reason I took this x-ray is because we happened to have a new 3D scan, a CT scan in our office. I said, let's take a picture of my tooth. And what we found, holy cow, is that I had a cavitation. This is a hole in my bone, huge hole in my bone. The, and although there was some pathology on the other x-ray, this clearly shows that this is a cavitation. I did opt to extract this tooth. So should we take out every single tooth that needs a root canal? Well, I think the human body is too complex to look at in a black and white way. Remember, we're trying to think about thinking in a very rigid, dogmatic way. If a person has a strong immune system, if the tooth is not really infected, maybe it's traumatized, maybe it has a little infection, maybe the infection hasn't shown up on the bone, the tooth might be favorable for treatment. Uh, they may be able, a patient may be able to tolerate a root canal because if a person, um, I'm sorry, uh, because a person that has a strong immune system with very little infection usually can tolerate a root canal because we have to think about what are, what are our options when we take out a tooth? How do we replace it? It's not easy. You, uh, you either you don't have a tooth or we have to now do surgery and place a dental implant. Um, so we always have to weigh the cost versus benefit of anything that we do. And so, you know, I as I said, I like to think about some of the consequences of what doing the root canal or extracting the tooth will be. And these are some questions um, that you may want to ask. One, why do I need the root canal? Is the tooth infected? And how severely infected? Was the tooth already treated with the root canal and now reinfected? The prognosis for that is probably 60 or 70 percent. I personally choose to take out a tooth for myself. If it happened to me, as it did, I would take it out because I don't believe necessary. that's my own belief system in um, uh, doing another root canal on a tooth that had a severe infection in the first place, uh, or in the second place. What is my current health status? How will extraction impact my teeth? And what will I do to replace the tooth if I were to opt for extraction? You know, I have personally spoke to the um, presidents and the other um, 
the other members of the organizations, the International Association of Organic Toxicology, the Holistic Dental Association, and they also take a very conservative approach. They do not say take out every root canal tooth. Um, they say judicious, the judicious use of root canal is appropriate, is appropriate therapy. But every single person is a different story. So we have to just ask certain questions. And again, we're targeting our therapy for an individual patient. So what we can do, another thing we can do, what I did want to mention is that with a 3D scan, if we've had a root canal, one thing you can do, because sometimes we can't always see an infection. And sometimes with a 3D scan, we actually do pick up um, an infection that is not visible on a two-dimensional x-ray, which is great that we have that capability today. And, you know, today we just have to remember that holistic dentistry or dentistry is one of flexibility, not of absolute rules. We have to take into account all the factors, and we can decide as a team what we're going to do in a very specific situation. And just as uh, we figure out how to save our teeth with root canals, we come to the topic that is the leading cause of tooth loss in adults. It is not dental decay, it is periodontal disease. What is periodontal disease? Periodontal disease is a plaque-induced inflammatory condition. Plaque is a biofilm. It is natural, we all have it. It's made of bacteria trying to attach themselves to the smooth surface of the teeth. It is a normal process. But when we leave the plaque on our teeth and let it build up to a thick layer, ever get the feeling you have sweaters on your teeth? Uh, the, the bottom layer of bacteria causes an inflammatory condition and releases toxins below the gum, which can destroy the bone. The microorganisms, these pathogens can leach out into our bloodstream, our lymphatic system, and can reach distant organs, causing an immuno-inflammatory response. <clears throat> there is emerging research on the interconnections between periodontal disease, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. Returning to our friend, the infamous Dr. Cotton, his treatments were based on the focal theory of infection, just what we're talking about with periodontal disease. That was 70, was it more than what, the 1930s? Ah, yeah, whatever. So that many years ago, that infection in one area of the body can disseminate into distant organs and tissues, showing, of course, that our bodies are interconnected. Our mouth is connected to the rest of our body, despite the fact that <coughs> dental school and medical school are two separate things. So after a 70-year hiatus, the theory has come back into medical favor because evidence is showing that periodontal disease has severe systemic implications. While we're not going to cut out your colon, we now see how crucial management of periodontal disease is. And the most important thing we do is to is prevent periodontal disease from ever occurring. Because once a diagnosis of periodontal disease is made, there is no cure, only management. And here is what you can do to prevent periodontal disease. Diet, it's the same as for cavity prevention. Low sugar, sugar causes severe metabolic disturbances. Not, it just doesn't only break out down the enamel, it changes, it changes our entire metabolism. Brushing and flossing, hmm. A simple removal of the soft plaque and the biofilm, removing the bacteria. Saliva testing, again, if you have poor quality saliva or not enough or inadequate flow, this can affect the outcome. And CoQ10 and vitamin C have been uh, implicated the deficiency, I'm sorry, deficiency of CoQ10 and vitamin C has been implicated as a precursor of periodontal disease. Stress, stress reduction, I mean stress, um, is found to be significantly correlated with periodontal disease and the higher the stress, the more severe and widespread the disease. What if you've been diagnosed already? Here are some new therapies available that make management of the disease possible. Scaling and root planing. Most importantly, attend your three-month periodontal maintenance visit. It is not a cleaning. It is not a cleaning. Um, we are disrupting the biofilm, the thin layer of bacteria that causes the breakdown of tissue and bone. You have to understand how strong this microscopic layer is. These are tight, tight, tight junctions. And unless they are broken up, there is nothing that is going to get past it. There is no rinse, there is no brush, there's nothing that's going to get past it. 90%, 90, full 90% of that biofilm is removed when the hygienist takes her instruments 
and removes the plaque. But they will recolonize in three months. Three months. I was reading a very serious research paper. And I thought it was funny that they said, these bacteria multiply like hell. Three months, recolonize. Yep, it's, that's exactly what they said. And we're going to work with an integrative health care provider because periodontal disease can be a result of immunosuppression. Uh, so this can be an important part of your therapy. Stress reduction, yoga, meditation, mindfulness training, lifestyle changes. Iodine, the dental hygienist will irrigate with iodine under the gum tissue. It's not something you're going to do at home. It will kill major periodontal pathogens within 15 to 30 seconds. And sodium hypochlorite, we talked about that before. Bleach, one part Clorox, 20 parts water. You can use it in a water pick. Probiotics, specific for the periodontal pathogen. It uh, displaces the bad guys. And coconut oil pulling, once again, we talked about that. It's antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial, uh, disrupts and displaces uh, the bacteria. Always remember, periodontal disease is non-curable. It is crucial to, management, uh, to manage it with regular therapy. And of course, your exquisite home care, which is probably 50% or more of, uh, of management of periodontal disease. So, some other areas that holistic dentists may utilize in the office are, as we talked about, CT scans, picking up cavitations, and for implant planning. And this is what um, well, the other car cardiologist lectured about was uh, sleep apnea. And why do I bring sleep apnea in? Because with the mouth being the beginning of the airway, we are in a very unique position, prime position to assist the medical community in detecting sleep disorders. Uh, we do a screening, and along with CPAP units, oral appliances such as this one, which is called the Somnodent, have been found to be a very, um, a very effective tool in managing sleep apnea. Saliva testing, um, this is how we test the saliva for pH, uh, buffering capacity, quantity, quality. And this is um, strep mutans before and after anti-cavity protocols. So this is strep mutans on this, uh, on this plate, the little bumps. And this is after the anti-cavity protocols. You could see nothing. This is lactobacillus, the other uh, cavity-causing bacteria, before and after, very few. So um, it is effective. Those uh, protocols that I mentioned are very effective in preventing cavities. So uh, we can talk about um, minimally invasive dentistry. That is another kind of um, idea and concept that's um, in the literature. And really what that means, this style of dentistry is, should be minimal dental involvement. That means minimal drilling and filling. Who doesn't want that? Um, it is uh, early detection of decay. For instance, this product called Icon, you can actually take a starter cavity and fill it without drilling your tooth. And it will stop decay. We also um, can use inlays and onlays. I, they're not, actually these are not new restorations. We've utilized those for, you know, decades. But what's new is that um, now, uh, instead of a full crown, where well, we used to have to take down the entire circumference of the tooth to a little stump, now we can preserve um, uh, to a healthy tooth structure with porcelain and bonded in place. And it can almost bring the tooth up to 100% of its original strength by doing that. Uh, again, we're trying to be much more conservative. And um, many people have become aware of the possibility of heavy, heavy metal toxicity with metal crowns and mercury fillings. You know, amalgam fillings are 50% mercury. So they should be called mercury fillings not amalgam fillings. So a uh, holistic dentist will, and this is, you know, these are large <coughs> amalgams, uh, will always have a very specific protocol uh, as outlined by a holistic dental association. I use the one by the IAOMT. Um, we use this dental air vac unit, which uh, removes all the particulate and aerosol. We um, do this protocol, we, we, we ask to see, we sometimes mention to the patient to see if an integrated physician for um, 
uh, supplements, chelation, whatever might be necessary, rubber dam, facial drape, high volume suction, chunking technique, um, and I'll just go back. So this <laughs> looks pretty awful, but um, this is the dental air vac unit. We use a rubber dam, we cover the patient, and uh, oxygen, and then ozone. This is one of the newest, den uh, newest directions in holistic dentistry. I'm very excited about that. Uh, the use of ozone as a disinfectant is not a new concept. It's just now being examined for use in dentistry. Interesting, interestingly, it can even stimulate your immune response when infection is present and can be used as an anti-inflammatory agent. It helps prevent tooth decay with simple, non-invasive treatment. Then we've got, many people ask about metal-free implants. So today we have zirconia implants. Uh, titanium implants have a great track record and uh, very, very biocompatible, but for patients that choose to have metal-free, there is zirconia implants now. So action plans. So we've covered a lot of information. It was very dense. So today, what am I going to do? What I, I don't know anybody's specific situation, of course, but what can you do to prevent oral disease? First, you can determine your risk factor. It's very simple, you spit in a cup. It's not difficult, and you go through the list that I gave before. And once you know your risk factor, you can make choices about x-rays or fluoride or whatever. If you are at high risk for cavities, some changes will be necessary, like elimination of sugar. Minimize carbs, have saliva testing. Um, great ideas to work with a nutritionist or integrative physician. You're going to brush and floss your teeth, that goes without saying, to remove the biofilm. You're going to have regular dental examinations, of course. So you can have minimally invasive dentistry, because if you wait too long, it's going to get deeper and you're going to need the more invasive um, types of procedures. Healthy diet. Again, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but you need adequate levels of CoQ10, vitamins A, C, and D, and again, highly re recommend seeing an integrative physician to ensure that you have uh, that you're operating at the best possible levels. What kind of toothpaste? As we mentioned before, if you're a low risk, you're going to use the ba most basic toothpaste possible. You're just going to brush and floss. And try a half an ounce of hard cheese. Why not after breakfast? Try oil pulling. These things, you know, they're very simple. And make sure that um, we're treating the whole entire family. For health for healthcare practitioners, I want to invite you to have an awareness of dentistry's connection with the whole body, uh, to be included in the process. And recently, I had a gentleman that was referred from the Ultra Wellness Center at Mark Hyman's, who's no longer there, Mark, Mark Hyman's Center. This patient had a ALS. And he was recommended to have his, all his amalgams removed, which is a reasonable request. Um, it's a neurotoxin, it's a reasonable request. However, when we did the full dental exam, he had severe periodontal disease. And as we mentioned, it has um, really uh, systemic implications because of the inflammatory condition of that um, and, the, and the response. So he declined having any periodontal treatment because he said his doctor only advised him to take out his amalgams. So you can see where we have a problem. It's like when our patients see a physician, if, uh, if the patient wasn't advised to have an, uh, a full examination, it really affects the outcome of treatment for the patient. Um, so uh, having a patient come in for a full risk assessment and examination is crucially important, not just to recommend the one thing, because patients take what you say very literally, very literally. And let's go back to Dr. Um, uh, Cotton's operating theater. You're strapped onto the operating table, and he's about to begin when the doors fly open, and the procedure is halted. Now, wouldn't you feel relieved? Well, I feel that way about holistic dentistry because it gives us a break from the rigid paradigm that dentistry has been stuck in for years. The open minds, collaborative, uh, collaborative approach to healthcare and healing, and the emphasis on patient education um, and participation is helping us and um, helping us from repeating the mistakes of the past. With so many opinions on dental care being strongly voiced by everyone on the internet and TV, it becomes hard to separate fact from fiction, especially when endorsements are by so-called experts.
So instead of being drawn into extreme camps, familiarize yourself. I urge you, familiarize yourself with the concepts I shared with you today. Be flexible in your thinking. Understand why things are happening in your mouth or your patient's mouth. Join me looking to the future where holistic dentistry will be um, the norm instead of the exception. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.